uh, tonight we have Tim Watkins here as our special guest tonight. Uh, Tim Watkins is the CEO of Renegade Communications here out of Hunt Valley, uh, Maryland. And tonight his talk is called, No Matter Where I Am, He Is Greater Than I. And some things that we just try to come down to is going to be a little bit of a personal testimony of his life. But also he's going to challenge us to bring the gospel out into the world. So we are very proud and very to have, happy to have Tim, Tim Walken. So if everyone can uh, welcome Tim Walken. something else that came along in my life, which is the messenger eagle. Um, at the end of uh, tonight, at the end of uh, the, the speaking points, I'm going to uh, give you all a free get out of purgatory card. Uh, so, um, so if you would uh, join me, I'm going to start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Juan Diego, you who were chosen by Our Lady of Guadalupe as an instrument to show your people and the world that the way of Christianity is one of love, compassion, understanding, values, sacrifices, repentance of our sins, appreciation and respect for God's creation, and most of all, one of humility and obedience. You whom we know is now in the kingdom of the Lord and close to our mother, be our angel and protect us. Stay with us as we struggle in this modern life, often not knowing where to set our priorities. Help us to pray to our God to obtain the gifts of the Holy Spirit and use them for the good of humanity and the good of our church. Through the heart of Our Lady of Guadalupe, to the heart of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, so I thought I'd go into a little bit of background of uh, my life. Um, real exciting. Uh, I was raised in a solid Catholic family. I was uh, very lucky and fortunate to have that foundation to stand on and return to. Uh, this is not a luxury that many have these days. Families are in a tough place. Uh, my dad was an entrepreneur and loved to tell stories. My mom, as most moms are, was the heart and tenderness. Together they raised six kids, of which I am the sixth. I was always a Sunday-going mass-goer. In, in fact, uh, my father was uh, troubled by the liberalism in the church of the 60s and 70s, so he sought out a lot of uh, authentic, orthodox ways for us to practice our faith. We went uh, wherever there were solid priests. We even had stints in the Byzantine church and spent a couple of years going to nights of recollection with uh, Opus Dei. I'm a big fan of Opus Dei. I'm not a member, at least not at this time, but I am very fond of Jose Maria Escobar's Prelature and, and uh, You'll hear a couple of quotes from him tonight. Uh, I was very fortunate to find a beautiful woman who had a fetish for fat, bald men. Uh, and I was the right guy for that job. So, uh, she was uh, a Lutheran who, con who converted before our marriage in 1988. It seems uh, she, was, she was smart enough to sense the special nature of a Catholic family and figured out that uh, that's what she wanted too. And uh, unfortunately, as often is the case, the convert and practice the faith better than the cradle Catholic. Started my business uh, in 1988. Uh, it's kind of funny, I have a degree in, in finance and accounting, and everything I've done at Renegade has pretty much been self-taught, which means I make a lot of mistakes and learn from them. So this foundation that my parents gave me and the new enriched faith my wife provided would be the glue that would help us keep all things together as in uh, 1997, uh, we were hit with our, our first little crisis, if you would. Uh, I had three children, uh, the first one, Megan, Timothy, and then my third child was Brian. Uh, in 1997, we found out Brian had autism. So uh, the story about Brian was, was a very interesting one, a very uh, 
big one in my life. It, 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 we had all the hope because there were plenty of people out there telling us about these miracle cures, and we hung on to those hopes. But we were finally worn down into our last bit of hope. The most, I think the most amazing miracle occurred. It was uh, 2002 when I started going to Mass every day uh, during Lent. I was gonna, it was a purely selfish pursuit of, of why him, why us, why me. I'm a good guy. I go to church. Why did this happen? You know? So during that time frame, uh, going to Mass every day, there were two new priests at our, at our parish. And, and uh, coming out of Mass one day, this one priest said to me, Who are you and what do you do? And it's a Tim Watkins, and I have an advertising agency and a production company. I do all this, and he goes, wow, well, Leo over here's got this crazy idea for a cooking show. He's even got a name for it. It's called Grace Before Meals. <laughs> my first thought was, great, a priest with a cooking show idea. You know, that's the last thing you want. Um, and I don't know how many of you know Father Leo Paddling Hug, but that actually became the, the beginning and genesis of Grace Before Meals. So that's one thing that occurred during that time frame. The second thing, and, and, and more special in my eyes, was uh, I attended the Special Olympics as I had done every year since we found Brian was with special needs. And uh, I, I think because I was going to Mass every day, my, my eyes were open, my ears, my heart. Um, and, and at that time, I, how many of you have been to Special Olympics before? A number of you. The incredible joy that these kids have on their faces. They'll never hate. They'll never judge. They only love. I think that's written somewhere in the good book. At that point, it came to me that, that maybe Brian was here for me and not me for him. And I kind of took him on as, as he was my guardian angel. And he was there and he taught me so much. So with that kind of story and that kind of childlike mentality, I, I remind you of the Gospel of Matthew that said that Jesus said, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. These strong, powerful words of Jesus Christ, meaningful and purposeful, are saying no one can truly be converted to the spiritual life and way of God unless you change to have that heart of a little child and can understand the humbleness, meekness, and the heart of that little child. It's a lot to do with faith. So in that first step, it, was, it became clear to me how evident it was that he, that he is greater than I. He taught me these lessons. He delivered these things for me. And, and there was something really good about this. So I now you know, know from this day forward, uh, that day forward, it became kind of a mission of mine to know, to love, to serve God and my neighbor, not just myself. As life continued on and... and Renegade was doing well, the business grew. I, I, I got to make uh, my first real feature documentary film. It's a film called In the Face of Evil, uh, based on Ronald Reagan's battle with communism. And uh, it was a fantastic uh, project to be involved with, and we, we really dove into the spirituality and the undertones that Reagan had. One of my favorite quotes that Reagan did have was, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, we'll soon be a, a nation gone under. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of that playing out right here in front of us. With this, this Reagan film, we uh, started, we, we got a lot of really interesting fans. Um, you know, calls from people like Bruce Willis and, and uh, uh, happenstance occurrences where we met Gary Sinise and talked to him about the film. And uh, uh, Jim Caviezel, you know, Jim Caviezel, he was Jesus in the Passion. And he would call me up and recite the script for the film. He had watched it so many times. Um, <laughs> It was actually funny. He was, he was reciting the script, and all of a sudden I heard this bang, bang, bang. And, and what are you doing? He said, I, There's a snake in my backyard. I was killing it. It happens all the time. So, uh, so one of the other fans was uh, Mel Gibson and, and his producer, Steve McAveedy. And Steve um, is, is uh, a big fan of, of the blood, of the, uh, in the face of evil. And a couple of guys approached him and asked him if he'd uh, help make a documentary film on, on Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so here I was a few years on in my faith journey and enriching my faith, and here comes this opportunity to make a film about Our Lady of Guadalupe, and, and uh, why would I turn it down? It was an amazing opportunity. Uh, at the time, I have to admit, I, I knew about this much about Our Lady of Guadalupe, and I, I, I bet if you watch the film, you'll agree that you knew this much. Uh, it, 
is one of the richest, most incredible stories uh, that if you learn the full, complete story and are able to tell it to other people, you will fascinate people and get them to want to know more about the mysteries of our faith. Um, the, the, the Blood and the Rose, which is the, the film on Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, became a project we started nearly seven years ago. Um, and it's had its ups and downs during, during the whole project. We were in Mexico and we were trying to research Cortez, and Cortez was the kind of the, the guy who liberated Mexico from the Aztecs at the time. And uh, they don't like him down there. And you can barely find anything. So we decided to go to Spain to where Cortez was from, a town called Medellin. And we're charting our course from Madrid to Medellin, and, and we see this place called Guadalupe on the map. Um, and so we said, well, we got to stop there. And that, that location, Guadalupe, just changed the entire story. Um, I, I, I should have asked you beforehand, it's my trick question, but how many of you know where Guadalupe is? And most people say Mexico, but Guadalupe is actually a city in Spain. There is no Guadalupe, Mexico. Um, and it's a fascinating part of the story. In this place in, in Spain is where Columbus signed the documents to go to America. It's where Cortes grew up and prayed. It's where Bishop Zumarraga was in monastery in Guadalupe, Spain. So there's this whole fascinating story that ties to this and goes back to Luke, the gospel writer, and a statue that Luke had carved. Um, so it's a fascinating piece of 1,500 years of church history uh, that goes into this one miracle that is so profound. Um, I'm going to enlist Jack to come up with the image. And I know it's... It's not the full-size image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. How many of you have been to Mexico to see the image? Okay. A couple? Okay. So if, if you've been to Mexico, you would know that this actual this is an actual replica of the image. And the actual image, well, this is an actual miniature replica. The actual image is about six foot tall. Okay, so it's as tall as we are. Uh, it has been proven by science that the colors and the imagery and the fabric and everything about it, just have, man could not have produced this. No one disputes that. This is a nearly 500 year old garment. Now, how many pieces of clothing do you have in your closet that are more than 10 years old? Okay, well I have a few. But they're, they're pretty ratty, you know, they, they get worn out. Um, this is an image that for hundreds of years before it went under protective cover, that people would touch it, kiss it, burn candles next to it, all sorts of things, and, and still it's in pristine, perfect condition. I've had the, the great privilege of actually kissing the glass that it's in and looking at the amazing, it's cactus fiber woven together. It's very bumpy, and it's, it's amazing to try and even believe that somebody could have painted an image. So, proven that it wasn't by, painted by anybody on earth, it was made by God. Some interesting things about it. And you can come up afterwards and look at this if you want, or we can even pass it around. Um, there is all sorts of Nahuatl symbolism. Nahuatl was the, the language of the Aztecs. And uh, so there are nine flowers on here. And the flower meant volcanic mountain or big hill. And there's only one four-petal flower here, which in the Nahuatl symbolism meant the one true God. Okay. But this four-petal flower is an approximate location of where Tepeyac Hill is, where the miracle occurred, amongst the nine volcanic mountains that surround Mexico City. Scientists have also proven that these stars, when they lay out the constellations touching these stars, actually are the constellations from the night of December 12, 1531. Okay? There's a constellation Leo, no, not Father Leo, but, but uh, again, a constellation Leo with one star, the constellation Leo touches the four-petal flower. Remember, the four-petal flower is the one true God and now it's symbolism. That one star that touches it is called the Little King. So here you have this date, time, location stamped document. Okay? And what's really a, another amazing fact is the eyes. I know the eyes are like this here, but through technology they have actually magnified the eyes 2,500 times and found 13 <laughs> images in each eye. Okay? Now, the, the images are in accordance with the ophthalmological laws, and I'm probably mm -hmm. slaughter of ophthalmological, and I probably will slaughter this next thing. Perkin G. Samson, which means he's bigger in this eye, smaller in this eye. You guys are bigger in this eye, smaller in this eye. You guys over here are bigger, smaller, but you're in the same location. 
and there are 13 images that are the same images in both eyes. So they're believed to be the witnesses of the Vir as the Virgin Mary is coming down to imprint herself on this image. Now, really interesting thing about, well, that's not interesting enough, but <laughs> another interesting thing about this is that what I just told you about the eyes and the stars could not have been detected until we had the technology to do so. So that means in the 20th century we were still uncovering interesting things about this image. It leads you, you know, one, to say something very trite, which is how magnificent is our God, but also ask a question, what else is in this image that we will find at a later date, since our Lord and Savior has to keep sending back his mother to kick our butts every once in a while when we gotta get out of sorts. So, um, there's, there's so much more about this image, and we cover an enormous amount of it in the film, but I, I wanted to do a little bit about this. The really important thing about this a hand for Jack. Didn't you do it right? isn't a parish in the country that doesn't have an image or, or, or a, a picture of what they call Our Lady of Guadalupe, okay? Uh, we're trying to make a little bit of a movement that, that says get rid of those imitations and get authentic replicas. Because what I just told you and about the image, you can only teach from the authentic image. So it's really important that we try to have authentic images of Our Lady of Guadalupe if we're going to call it Our Lady of Guadalupe because the story is so magnificent that if you could, that hangs in my office, and, and I can't tell you the number of meetings that I have in my office of, of people visiting. When I, we almost always wind up over there talking about people that are Catholic, not Catholic, and they're all going, no way. You know, and it's, it's an unbelievable thing. So it's an amazing thing you can teach from it, and, and, you, and you can learn from it, you can continue to learn from it, and it's a great thing to have in your office overlooking you, make sure you don't mess up. So. Um, so the authentic image and the importance of the authentic image plays right into the, the importance of us seeking our authentic Catholic faith. Uh, every Sunday, and, and hopefully if you say the rosary every day or, or on occasion, we take a pledge in that in every Sunday we say the creed. And we say the creed for our rosary, which says we, we, we profess to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It is important that we stay with the and learn and, and grow with an authentic Catholicism and heart and mind. With that, an interesting, another interesting part of the story, I, how many of you know the name of the guy that she came to and imprinted on his film? Do you know his name? St. Juan Diego. St. Juan Diego, right? Of course, I said the prayer to him in the beginning, kind of gave it away, right? Juan Diego's Nahuatl name, before he converted to Catholicism, was Quatatola. Quatatolak translated into English meant messenger eagle. He was born to be the messenger eagle. He was born to deliver this message. I believe that there's a little bit of messenger eagle in all of us, um, which is another theme of what we're trying to do is, is we just actually started the Messenger Eagle Foundation, which we're trying to help uh, make people understand the needs of the authentic image and to be able to teach to the image and the importance of this. So, um, and, and one of the things that inspires the uh, uh, quote from uh, St. Jose Maria Escobar, um, take one step back, the messenger eagle, and of course the, the wings of the eagle on there are very important. So in the life of the messenger eagle, uh, St. Jose Maria Escobar said, uh, quote, get rid of that small town outlook, enlarge, it, enlarge your heart till it becomes universal, Catholic. Don't flutter about like a hen when you can soar to the heights of an eagle. He is greater than I, converges with messenger eagle, at least in my life. Uh, as, as, our, as we're moving along in this film and we're producing this and creating this film, the, the company continues, Renegade continues to grow, and uh, we set off on another course. We invest in creating a Catholic marketing department. We now have full, four full-time people, which Jack is one of, on our Catholic marketing department. We've, our 25th anniversary will be on August 1st. And uh, we've had great successes, and, and so we're trying to take these secular talents into the Catholic world. Um, and uh, one of the times when I was talking uh, to a group of people about marketing, we talked about how the devil's favorite tool is sublime marketing. Uh, now, there's bad news and good news. The bad news is, is he's fooled a lot of souls. The good news is, is we can do it too. 
and, and you can talk to us. <laughs> well, and it's very important that we do. It's, it's one way to engage in, in spiritual warfare is to try and, and be sublime to get your friends and other people around you to understand. You, know, you, you say, hey, I saw this thing about our baby Guadalupe. It's an amazing thing. You ought to look at this and that. So it's proven not to be made by man. Well, who could have been, who could have been made by um, you know, in part, we told you there's a story on this image, right? There's, there's a, literally a story. So, if no man made that, and there's a story on this, then it's what? It's the Word of God. Okay? So, so here you have right before you the Word of God. Um, and, and if you ever get a chance to go down and see it, it's just absolutely magnificent. People come from hundreds of miles away, and, and within miles of the place, they actually start crawling there. I mean, it's an amazing devotion. So, uh, it seems like through all of these calls that, that have occurred throughout my life, what I didn't realize was that there actually is a higher purpose that uh, I've, I've been given an opportunity to fulfill on. Uh, and that, you know, I, I, I pray every day that I can be the best messenger eagle that I can. Um, and, and in order to do, be that, prayer and faith is a very important part of my life. Um, St. Jose Maria Escrivá said about prayer, he said, uh, you haven't been praying? Why? Because you haven't had time? But you do have time. Furthermore, what sort of works will you be able to do if you have not meditated on them in the presence of the Lord, so as to put them in order? Without that conversation with God, how can you finish your daily work with perfection? Look, it is, this, it is as if you claimed you had no time to study because you were too busy giving lessons. Without study, you cannot teach well. Prayer has to come before everything. If you do not understand this and put it into practice, don't tell me that you have no time. It's simply that you do not want to pray. A healthy prayer regimen. Uh, how many people work out every day? Get a good workout. <laughs> I've got uh, my middle child, he works out almost every single day, he's like really stud. He walks around with you know, no shirt on, he's got the six pack. I pull my shirt, I won't do it. <laughs> I, I pull my shirt up and I go, I got a six pack, mine's just in a cooler. So, um, but, uh, you know, physical workouts and, and exercise are very important to keep us heart healthy. Eating properly, heart healthy again. But a spiritual workout is one of a prayer regimen that we, we should undertake every single day. Um, let's do this one. I have a little uh, handout. It's actually one that was given to me about uh, being a daily communicant, which is actually kind of fun. You'll see it's got seven candles on it. And for the person who, who only goes to Mass on Sunday, it's got a very brightly lit candle on Sunday, and they get dimmer throughout the week. For somebody who goes to Mass every day, the, the candles lit bright every day of the week. That can be the same with prayer as well. You can enrich your life. You can keep the light on every day. You prepare yourself well. And the sublime nature of prayer in, in all different ways, you can do it when you're at the table, in a restaurant, at work, anywhere. You can say grace before meals. You can do that very visible sign of the cross. And encourage, it, it gets people to stop and remember that they need to give thanks for what they've been given. When somebody sneezes, don't say bless you. Say, God bless you. You know, bring God in your life in every way you can. And just have things around your office or wherever you work, in your home. Have spiritual reminders. We're, we're, we're a, a faith rich in history and icons. And these icons are not for us to worship those icons, but they're to remind us of people who lived a good life that we need to model ourselves after. So incorporating in your business work, um, this is a, a long quote, but uh, St. Jose Maria Escobar said, uh, uh, titled, By Their Fruits You Will Know Them. There is no excuse for being unproductive. Some might say I don't know enough, but that is no excuse. Or else I am unwell, I haven't much talent, the conditions are not right, my surroundings. These aren't excuses either. How pitiful the man who adorns himself with the foliage of false apostolate, who has all the outward appearance of leading a fruitful life, but is not sincerely attempting to yield fruit. It looks as though he is using his time well. 
He seems to get around to organize things, to be inventing new ways of solving all kinds of problems, but he has nothing to show for his efforts. No one will benefit from his works if they have no supernatural content. Let us ask our Lord that we may be souls who are ready to work with a heroism that proves fruitful. For there is no lack of people here on earth who on being approached turn out to be nothing but large, shiny, glossy leaves, foliage, just foliage and nothing more. Meanwhile, many souls are looking, for, looking to us, hoping to satisfy their hunger, which is hunger for God. We must not forget that we all have the means we need. We have sufficient doctrine and the grace of God in spite of our wretchedness. And one of my favorite ones by St. Jose Maria Escobar. So, how many, of, how many of you have ever gotten really upset and angry and defensive? How many? And you knew you were flat out wrong. How many? Yeah, okay. It's just kind of, you felt it, right? You knew what you were doing was wrong. I mean, it's, a, it's another amazing gift from God that, that we've been given to know the difference between right and wrong. And, and throughout life, we're given these opportunities to, to kind of right our ship because you know something's wrong. You know if you've lied to someone or done something wrong, that the, the best way to, to deal with that is to come clean. You know, God gave us this talent, and it's the best, way to, the best pathway to heaven. So, you know, some of these things that we have, um, I want to talk about a, a, a new topic that I like to talk about. Was, I call it sacramentality. Um, have you ever heard of sacramentality? Have you really? I thought I made it up. I think so. There goes the copyright. <laughs> you know, we, we have seven sacraments, right? Did I get that right? All right. So we have seven sacraments. I'm going to talk about marriage because I'm married. And, and uh, just like my business, it's going to be 25 years old. My wife is going to have stuck with me for 25 years this October. So, um, you know, it's an amazing thing to, to meet somebody who's had one marriage and it's 25 years in this day and age. And many would argue with you that it's because we do not prepare well enough for marriage, that we don't take the appropriate amount of time to prepare for marriage, that we don't let God into the marriage, that we don't have a spiritual marriage. It's a very important thing on this sacrament of marriage. It is a sacrament. It is an important thing we need to understand. It's not just a party, no matter what four weddings shows. And my daughter's getting married in June next year, so I'm seeing four weddings virtually four times every night. Um, so it's, it's uh, but you know, you see all these really big parties and there's no God. Rarely do you see, you know, a God episode. So it's very important that we have God in our lives in marriage. And remember, you know, I have this, uh, this saying that you're only one word away from divorce. I'm not sure what that one word is, but I really want to make sure I'm thinking my way through it so I don't mess that up and, and say that one word. So, you know, communication in a marriage is very important. Uh, having the faith and ability to have honest communications and make sure you know where you want to go in your marriage, things will change. You know, not everything's the same in, in 25 years. Uh, I had hair. It was one thing, so yeah. So she's dealt with it, but that was a good one. But you know, many things change. There are many challenges. You you get curveballs thrown at you, like an autistic kid, or or something like that along the way. But you know, we were able to find. It took us a while, but we were able to find the true love and the nature of God in our son Brian. And he has changed our lives, and he's led us to a better place. That couldn't have been done if we didn't have that bond of marriage together. It goes all the way back to, to Mary's faith-filled yes. We often forget in order for, for that to really have worked out, Joseph had to say yes, too. Because here was a situation in those times that wasn't really a good thing. You know, she could have been stoned, you know, had he rebuked her and had she been out in the public as a pregnant woman out of wedlock. Uh, so it, it took two, a husband and a wife, to make that marriage solid. Um, the other thing I like to challenge you about on a, on a sacramentality side is, is the Eucharist. Um, you know, I know that, that for a long time, um, you know, the Eucharist was something after uh, the priest finally got done with that homily. And, you know, we knelt down for a little while, and like, come on, you know, and, and bells rang. And, and, okay, time to get up and go there, you know. And, and then you walk down there, it's Jack. Is that thing? I gotta get that thing. You know, a, a 
take one of those to go, please. Um, you know, the Eucharist is, is, in my, you know, perhaps one of the most important things we could participate in on a weekly basis. I highly recommend the daily form of it. But what are you thinking of when you're walking down that aisle? Are you preparing that this might be the last time you could ever partake of our Lord and Savior? That He is actually there? Um, you know, I know I've been in a, in a few bars in my life and, and had a few too many drinks in my life and, and woke up the next morning and went, oh, man, I can't believe I got up. It's a miracle. It really wasn't. You know, it, it was a good thing that I got up. But, you know, a real miracle, we've cheapened the word miracle so much that we don't recognize that, that persona Christe, Father John Paul, turns ordinary bread and wine into the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, and that he is there before us in church. And that still means when Mass is over, he's still there. So get out and talk outside. Be respectful. That's, that's the place of worship. And so it's very important that we respect the Eucharist in, in, in all places. Um, the, the, the other thing I... I Again, I, I, I love the rosary. I do the rosary in the car. Almost, almost religiously. I'm going to call Jack up here for a second. A demonstration. How many people pray the rosary? All right. Let's see how many pray it like I do sometimes. All right. if, if you do it in a group, yeah, it's really fun. Cause we go to Mass together a bunch of times. We do it in a group. Sometimes we feel like it's Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord, with thee, blessed art thou, my one blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord, with thee, blessed art thou. Yeah, it's funny, but we do it, don't we? Um, I'm, I'm going to challenge you the next time you say the rosary, spend a full minute on the meditation, just thinking about the meditation. Let it sink in. Let, let it sink in that at the visitation, when Mary visited Elizabeth, it wasn't Elizabeth that left, it was what? It was the child in the womb that left. Again, the child, the faith of a child left in the presence of our Lord. That child in the womb knew that the Lord was in front of us. We know where the Lord is. Are we leaping for the Lord? We should be leaping for the Lord. Kind of a last area I want to jump into is uh, I saw a fascinating quote, or at least what I think is a fascinating quote from Pope Francis. And uh, uh, I, I've been really excited about Pope Francis. I think he's uh, doing some really interesting and, and fun things. And, and uh, uh, I look forward to, to his papacy. But uh, he recently said in talking about himself and his fellow priests, he said, we priests tend to clericalize the laity. We focus on the things of, of the clergy, more specifically the sanctuary, rather than bringing the gospel to the world. A church that limits herself to administering parish work experiences what someone in prison does, physical and mental atrophy. We infect lay people with our own disease, and some begin to believe the fundamental service God asks of them is to become greeters, lectors, or extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion in church. Rather, the call is to live and spread the faith in their families, workplaces, schools, neighborhoods, and beyond. The reform that's needed is neither to clericalize nor ask to be clericalized. The lay person is a lay person. He has to live as a lay person, to be a leaven of the love of God and society itself. He is to create and so hope to proclaim the faith from his everyday life. I believe that Pope Francis is asking us to step up and be messenger eagles of today, spreading the word and the truth, which is a very important thing for us to do, to no longer just be passive in the pews, but to be very proactive in our lives, participants in the faith, and, and helping people see the greatness of our faith, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. As we face some, some very difficult times in the pursuit of what's called religious freedom, I want to kind of throw out some things to think of. This religious freedom issue is a very dicey issue. Uh, how many of you know World War II? <laughs> All right, just want to make sure. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's still in the uh, history texts. But, but uh, religious liberty is not unlike when the Americans combined with the Russians to defeat the, the evil Germans, the Nazis. Okay? That's what our battle with religious liberty is similar to. 
rest assured, there are significant cultural differences between the Americans and Russians, just as there are us and the other ones that we're fighting religious freedom battles with, mostly man-made belief systems. Because we only know, at least I only know, of two faiths created by God, the Jews and the Catholics. The one holy Catholic and apostolic church is the one that, that our God, our Lord, and Savior Jesus Christ created. So we have to remember and keep in perspective. Hopefully we win this battle of religious liberty. But when it's done, you have to remember your allegiance first is to Christ the King and the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And it's our job to be messenger eagles to go out and convert others to our faith. Actively, by, by actively living our faith in their presence is the best way to do it. Use words when, taught, when, when necessary. Um, I always like to think of our faith as being the most exclusive country club. The requirements are heavy, burdensome. Its rewards are unmatchable. Um, with that, I have some handouts to, to share with you. The first one is, uh, you know, I titled the talk, He is Greater Than I. I have uh, the Catholic Marketing Group and, and uh, not that one, the next one. The, the Catholic Marketing Group and, and I in my office. You can't sit down at my desk without saying, He is Greater Than I. Uh, a lot of people have uh, mistaken that for me to be giving a message to my employees that, you know, I'm greater than they are. But, but, uh, you know, uh, 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 we do explain that at some point. Uh, so Jack's got a couple handouts that he's given. Uh, the, the, the one, Jack, can I have a copy of that one? It does say uh, Catholic Business Network of Northern Virginia, but I had a whole bunch of extras that I printed out there. It's got the San Jose Maria Escrava quote about soaring like an eagle. And it's got this wonderful other quote by San Jose Maria Escrava uh, about the prayer that I did. And it's also got a great cartoon, The Shepherd's Voice, on there, which I think is kind of fun. You know, if you have these things and leave these things around where you work and where you live, they'll serve as great reminders, but they'll also serve as uh, very intriguing things for your friends to see. Um, so, thank you. All right, let's bust up this place. Well, if you want more information about the film, thebloodintherose.com is, is the name of the website. Um, you know, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, there are some copies of the movie back there, but actually both movies, the Reagan movie and the Blood and the Rose. Um, and uh, I promised you I would give you a get out of purgatory card free. Um, I have uh, completed three years uh, on the United you know, Kingdom, three years of the 12 year prayer of St. Bridget, which promises by uh, Vatican authority that you will be treated as a martyr upon your death and you will be spared purgatory. And not only that, you get to bring three people with you. So I told my wife she better start praying this because you know, I got to care of the three kids, right? So. <laughs> How's that for a 25th anniversary present? So, um, but uh, this is a copy of the card that I have, and, and uh, it's a lousy copy, and I purposefully gave you a lousy copy. Because if you call the number on there and pay $3 to the group that's doing this, you'll be supporting a really good group. And it's a, an incredibly wonderful card. It's a plastic laminated card. I'm hoping mine will last me 12 years. Um, but they are beautiful prayers. Um, I've gotten to the point where I've, uh, if I get in the right rhythm, I've memorized them. Um, and in addition to the 12-year prayer of St. Bridget, there are the seven sorrows of Mary on there. Again. Wonderful prayers to put into your life and into your action and to meditate on. You'll, you'll think, think them through. Um, so uh, I'm going to close with a prayer and then I'll answer some questions if that's okay. Am I long or is it good time? Okay. Uh, the, the final prayer I have is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's a personal intercession. Please feel free to make it your own. It goes like this. Juan Diego, you inspire us to be humble, magnanimous, and obedient. Teach us the way to be messenger eagles as you were, and to spread the word of God and the goodness of our maker. Amen. Amen. Anybody have any questions?
the call to be messenger eagles is, is an important part of the new evangelization. Uh, Father John Paul Walker does an amazing job with the time he has. He's always working. He's always trying to spread the work. But he's only one person. And there are hundreds and thousands of us that can help him outside of the church. It's not just our job to participate in the Mass and be the one. It's a very important part of a Mass is to participate in the Mass and be there for the Mass. But we've got to help him do his job. And that's, that's the new evangelization. I think sometimes we've mistaken the new evangelization for uh, a movie. Well, it's not really just the movie. It's about the message of the movie, carrying it forward, telling that message, um, and spreading the word. More importantly, it's about spreading the word of God um, and, and living the word of God, being examples for people in life. So I, I think our challenge is, is that, you know, at least in my time frame in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we were all PC'd into a closet. You know, we were told not to offend people. Um, that, you know, we should, you know, making people upset, saying the right things to make people upset. Well, oddly enough, it's time for us to come out of the closet. And it's time for us to start doing the good work. Um, the priests have been fighting the battle long enough and on their own, and their numbers are, are low, hopefully getting better. So certainly the Dominicans. Got to be something good going on there. Yes? Um, I've, I remember hearing that... Uh the sun and the moon and the little angel below it were added later. Is that true? That, I, there, there, are some, I, there are some people who believe that that can't be proven false or true um, one way or another. Um, so there, there, there is a possibility, uh, as well as the crown. And, oh. and some even say the light rays behind are all possible add-ons. It doesn't take away from the magnific magnificence of the actual image itself, uh, as well as the other things like the eyes. Just no way anybody could have painted that in the eyes. So. Google it. You'll see the images online. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Couldn't have said that in 15. Yes? How's the reception of the blood in the rose been? I've heard of it through Father Leo's uh, um, emails, but you usually have to go to where he is in order to see it. So. It's been horrible. People hate it. No. <laughs> um, the, the film's been very well received. We've been, uh, we premiered in Washington, D.C. the night before the March for Life. Uh, it was actually very interesting. We had uh, a lady from Nebraska who came to the event, and uh, she felt so compelled by the message of the, the film and the spiritual event messages from the speakers. She went back and, and decided she was going to become a messenger eagle and got a group of people went to Planned Parenthood to save three lives that next day. So... Um, yeah, the message rang true for her. Um, we've been in Colorado Springs where we did seven nights in Colorado Springs Diocese. Sunday, I'm flying with Jack and a group of others down to Brazil where the film will be shown four times once a featured event and um, you know, we'll be speaking in front of the, the pilgrims as well. So uh, the film is now in English, Spanish, and Spanish with Portuguese subtitles. We have a family day event in Madrid that's in the plannings right now, which the family day event last year drew more than a million people. Um, so we've got some pretty fascinating, interesting things. What this film has going for it, it has, it's documentable. It's a great story. You can use the image to tell the story. It's miraculous. It's fascinating. Uh, sharing this story opens up the eyes of people that, that may be doubters in God. And it, it gives us a chance, it gives us a tool to help. It's not the only tool that it's going to take to help people that are, that are suffering. Uh, but it's certainly a great tool to help. Yes? Did the image come with an apparition? Yes. And did the apparition have prophecies that I wrote? Not that I'm aware of. She didn't tell me. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, the, the main part of the apparition was that he was told to take, to, to, he was first told to go to the bishop and told to build a church. Um, and the bishop said, send me more proof, I don't believe you, you're just crazy. Um, the second appearance was more the same, he said, I'm not worthy, I'm just a nobody. Um, and she said, no, you must go back. And he said, bring me some proof. And so he went went uh, back to her, told her he wanted proof. She said, come back the next day. The next day he didn't come back because his uncle was sick. And uh, believing that 
his uncle was about to die, he was going to the church to, um, to go get a priest for last rites for his uncle. And uh, so he was going to sneak around the other side of the mountain, but she outsmarted him um, and found him on the other side of the mountain and told him, no, don't worry about your uncle. I've taken care of your uncle. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, she said, go up and collect roses at the top of the hill. And she, he, he got the roses and he took the roses. He thought the reveal was the roses when he pulled away and the roses fell to the ground and the image was on there. Um, was the, the, the final part of it. Now, the other part of the story that a lot of people don't hear about is that, you know, after that they all went to go see his uncle, the bishop included with the image, and they went there and he was healed. And uh, they, they, he said this lady came to her and she said, I am Our Lady from Guadalupe. And there's some argument about that. The Mexicans say, she didn't say anything about Guadalupe. The Mexicans can be very defensive about this Guadalupe thing. They don't like the, you know, the Spain connection in some ways, but the um, fact is that it's, it's tied. They say, she said, she is Cuatalope, um, which Cuatalope translated means she who crushes the head of the serpent. The big question is what the heck would that mean to an Aztec at, at the time? They wouldn't have any biblical idea what that meant in the revelations of Genesis. And, and uh, so, a whole big story to it, yeah. including the meaning today. I, I guess, you know, we, we go into this in the movie, and if you get a chance to see the movie, it'd be great. But, you know, that four-petal flower, the only four-petal flower, uh, meaning the one true God, other parts of the image, her head is bowed, her knee is bent, and her hands are cupped. And in, in knowledge of symbolism, cupped hands means making a home. So she's making a home for Christ, the one true God. So that's why she's the patroness of life. And it's very important. That's why she's not, I don't want to say this in a long way, but she's not just a Mexican thing which is what a lot of us have thought, that it's a Mexican apparition. She is the patroness of life. She's the patroness of the Americas. In fact, she's the patroness of the Philippines. Um, so she's, and the bigger part of it is, is, you know, Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Fatima, Quito, Cabello, Guadalupe, she's all the same lady, <laughs> you know. So it's important to keep that in perspective as we get, you know, nation proud. Any other questions? Yes. Um, you, of course. Now you spoke about the importance of bringing for the lady faith into every aspect of their lives, including the working world. And in your particular case, you were able to do that in a very unique way. I mean, but also, you know, you're this kind of big shot CEO. You can have your own Catholic marketing thing, whatever. What about some someone fresh out of college in a first job, low? man, low woman on the totem pole in a very secular work environment, maybe even anti-religious work environment, how does someone in that situation bring their faith to the working world, bring their faith to their job? Well, again, a, a lot of sublime work, and it may sound silly, but, you know, reminding or telling people that I'm so blessed, you know, the opportunities I get, it's, it's a blessing, I, I, you know. God has given me great things. You know, you, you, it's just the way you communicate and the way you talk and the examples that you, you are for other people. You know, I, I, I've got uh, played softball last night, and I had a bunch of guys where four years ago GD was a common word on the bench. Now a person says that now, and it's I, you know basically I've taught them all that hey, don't blame him. You're the one that made the bad play. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. But and in the same respect, here's another really interesting story. I have a friend who claims to be an, an atheist, and he was railing on his boss one day, and just how, what a jerk his boss is, and, and, and he said that GD, S-O-B, and, and, uh, and then he realized, he goes, he goes, oh, I'm sorry, Tim, I didn't mean to say that, and I said, that's okay, George, it gives me hope that you believe. Keep down, obviously, <laughs> you're asking for him to do something, so there must be something, and of course, then he called me an S-O-B. So, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, these, these are the things, you know, you, you live in the witness, you know, you, you, I mean, we talk about things all the time we do on a weekend, right? Why not talk about a great homily you heard, you know, at church, it's a, a great life lesson, don't call it a homily, I had a great life lesson this weekend, you know, I was at church and Father told me this, it was amazing, you know, it's, it's, it's putting those little things in people's lives that make them think because
because there, we're at such a point right now where we're being told so much what to do, and we're programmed, and we're tied to our devices. I'm one of those that's included. Um, but you know, there's so many things we can do from, from every level of, of work. It is great. I mean, I, I, I have the greatest job on earth. Okay, you're right. I can pretty much do what I want. Uh, but if the company's not making money uh, and, and on the secular side, and, if we're, and, and we won't do the secular side, rather there's a standing order, we don't embarrass the parents, no, the kid is not the smartest person in the house, mom and dad, are, no, no, nothing will be done creatively without a mom and a dad, the dad won't be made to be an idiot. Um, you know, the meaning of family and family life is, is, you know, we have gone 30 years now of entertainment of, of dumbing down the family and making it seem unimportant as we have got. Civics is out of school, so we don't know where our civic responsibility. Part of civics is, is a religious obligation to serve others, not yourselves. That's what civics was about. And now we've got a, a, a situation where we've got a governmental system where they want you to be hell-bent and, and, and hooked on everything that they have. They're trying to do in charities so that they can take care of everything. And I don't think that's the kind of world we want to live in. I think it's a better place when we take care of each other. So, better job. <laughs> Got any more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sometimes we're a little shy of asking questions. Are you going to be around a little bit so we can I am. ask you up close and personal? Okay, great. All right, so I have heard of the movie, uh, The Blood and the Rose, and I'm very excited that it's here tonight. I do have uh, copies for sale. Um, I've been told that the DVD is $20 and that there's a guy that is $15. I assume uh, the, uh, the other uh, DVD is the same, $20. So, so those are going to be back there at that table, and um, if you want to look more into it, you can go to thebloodandrose.com, as uh, Tim Watkins told us earlier. So, uh, we'll uh, talk about uh, what's going to happen next week. Our guest is a old friend of mine. He's a seminarian in uh, Washington State, and uh, his name is uh, Matt Fish, and. Uh, you know, I was thinking how wonderful it would be if we could have him uh, speak over the summer, but he was in Rome. And uh, lo and behold, the next day, as I was, you know, in prayer, asking, and he puts on his Facebook, uh, I will be in Washington, D.C. this summer. And he's, you know, he's from Washington State. So I immediately sent him a message and said, hey, you know, uh, Lord Nate Theology on tap, can you speak for us? I think you'd be wonderful. And he had to check around and see what he had going off this schedule, and we have him coming next week very happy. He's actually in a uh, retreat right now, so if you can pray for him uh, this week as he's in retreat. And here's a synopsis of his talk. Um, it's about hope. And so what he says is, hope is usually the neglected member of the three theological virtues. But in fact, it is hope that brings the truths of faith to bear in our daily lives gives us motivation to live the daily life of charity that most distinguishes us as Christians in a world longing for meaning, marked by fear and temptation to despair. And so this evening, Matthew will speak about the importance of hope and how it is, its right understanding and exercise can change the way you live your life. That's going to uh, tie in so much to what Tim Walken spoke, in, uh, spoke about tonight, about living our faith the way that it was meant to be lived and so that we don't, you know, ever fall into hiding into a corner. We're going to be susceptible to that because, you know, life is not perfect, but uh, we can get out of it. So that is next week's speaker, Matt Fish. I look forward to seeing you there. Um, we have an email list for those of you who are new here. Uh, there are some new people here tonight, so if you would like to be on the email list and you can get the updates that we send out uh, during this time at the Odd Dump Tap, please come see me and we'll get you on that list. You can also find us on Facebook under the Odd Dump Tap Point. And 
that um, before Father John Paul goes on, because I'm just going to leave it to him. Uh, but, you know, we uh, subsist on donations. They're a great help. So whatever you can give to us, I'll be sitting in that corner over there with the email address and the jar. And when you're done, Father, can you tell them to introduce themselves to each other, especially if they're new, and get to know each other and just have a good time and maybe drink some beer? Okay. Thanks, Rodney. Um, just a couple uh, things coming up. I know there are some new faces here, maybe some people new to Baltimore. Um, the Baltimore Frasati Fellowship is a young adult, and by that we mean Catholic 20s and 30s outreach we have out of St. Philip and James here in Baltimore. The next two weekends, we've got two big things happening. This coming Saturday, this next Saturday, is our July Frasati night. It starts at 7 o'clock in the church. We have a speaker. It's one of our seminarian Dominican brothers who will be speaking. We have a series on the uh, Beatitudes. So this month is Blessed Are the Meek. So Brother Allen's going to be speaking on that. That starts at 7. Then we have a holy hour with some praise and worship music. Multiple priests available to hear confessions during the holy hour. Benediction. And then a big um, social in the church hall afterwards. So that all starts 7 o'clock this Saturday. If anyone are bakers, I know they're looking for people to bake some home-baked goodies. Caitlin, actually, right here, is organizing that. So if you want to bake something, please come say, uh, talk to Caitlin. We'd love to have that. We have a little fancy coffee milk frothing machine to make cappuccino-type coffees to go with our baked desserts. It'll be a lot of fun. That's this Saturday. The next Saturday after that, the 27th, we're doing a river tubing outing at Gunpowder Falls River State Park River. So that starts at 10 on Saturday and runs to like 3 or 4 in the afternoon. Info on both of these are available on our Facebook page, Baltimore Frasati Fellowship, or on the webpage, baltimorefrasati.org. And top secret info that almost no one knows. Um, just in the last few days, a benefactor donated to us a second-class relic of Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frasati. It's a piece of the bed sheet he was lying on when he died at age 24. And that is going, that relic will have, a, it will debut a Saturday uh, at our Frasati night. So it's in a case and everything. So we invite you to come. It's, uh, we're very blessed that someone gave this to us. Um, they can come and learn more about Blessed Pierre Giorgio. So the next two Saturdays, events happening. And again, if you're new, or if you're not new, say hi to the people around you. Sign up for the email list, which is the Theology on Tap email list, different from the Frasati email list that you can find on our website. And um, uh, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, a big thanks to, to Tim and his witness. He's been a great blessing in my life the last couple of uh, months that I've gotten to know him, and uh, hopefully at some point coming forward, going forward, we'll be able to show his film at our parish, maybe have him speak at that as well. And last, you heard him talk about Father Leo, the cooking priest. There's a little preview of coming attractions. He's going to be with us for our September uh, Frasati night as well, and is going to do a cooking demonstration as part of that, so we're really excited about that. So thanks for all for coming. Uh, see you hopefully Saturday at Prasadi night. See you next Tuesday at Theology on Tap. In the meantime, have a good time and buy more beer. Thank you. Thank you.